Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Laura and I'm currently a foundation year two doctor up in Leeds. I've done a bit of work for um, Quesmed. I've been helping them with the undergraduate textbook and I've also been starting a podcast with Priyash as well. So if you want to give that a listen, that would be great. Um, so Priyash has asked me to do the lecture for you guys on SBAs in rheumatology for finals. So I imagine that you're all final year students at the moment coming up to your finals. And so what this is, there's a mixture of degree of difficulty for some of these SBAs, but I think they really pick up on good learning points. And we'll talk about it as we go through. We're not going to be really spoon feeding you information, but it's a bit about exam technique, but then also a little bit on um, common themes that come up in SBAs. So I think Priyash, if you're able just to monitor the chat and shout out any questions as we go along, we'll get cracking. So the reason why rheumatology is basically my favorite specialty and something that I'm thinking about doing more long term is because it's literally everywhere. It's in primary care and you'll see it a lot, but it also has it's so like multidisciplinary and you see it across so many different types of specialties. So even throughout I've done a rheumatology placement in my foundation years, but even then it crops up over and over and over again. And it's a really common, not only SBA sort of territory, but also for OSCEs as well. You have really stable patients with unbelievable signs. So for lots of these um, diagnoses and disorders that we talk about, also think, how could it crop up in my OSCE examinations? And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. We're going to talk a little bit about red flags as well, um, especially for back pain, for septic arthritis, and then some of the weirder and more wonderful, which you think will never crop up in clinical practice. But I'll tell you a case that I came across later in the talk, and I'll just show you that it does crop up everywhere. And it's actually really good to have these sorts of diagnoses um, under your belt. So as long as there are no questions, I think we'll just get started. So this is the first SBA. So I think we're going to give you, is it a minute or a couple of minutes? And there's going to be a poll that's put up as well. And Priyash, if you can let me know the results as well of the poll, that would be great. Can you see those results, Laura? I actually cannot. I can see none of the po poll results. Oh, huh. okay. Well, the majority of people have gone for B. For B. Okay. Excellent. Good start. Exactly. That's exactly right. This question is basically just picking apart your red flags for back pain. Back pain not only comes up in SBAs all the time, but I've had at least one, probably two OSCE stations in my final OSCEs over fifth and sixth year that were based on back pain. It can come up in GP, it can come up in acute oncology. Um, and then because it comes up in oncology, it can come across over so many other specialties as well. It can come across like breast, um, urology. And so it's really good to have the red flags for back pain kind of at the forefront. So if we go through the STEM, so it's a 64 year old male, it's a two week history of gradually increasing back pain between his shoulder blades. And in terms of back pain between his shoulder blades, I'd, I'd just as off the front, that makes you think this is really unusual. This is either thoracic or even it could be cervical um, back pain, but also it's going towards the back. So when I first read this question, I also thought what else causes like radiating back pain between the shoulder blades and scarier things like an aortic dissection. So even then this should get your back up as a question that's pointing at a serious pathology. In final year, OSCEs and unlike MRCP, what they do is they don't really give you any red herrings. So the following information is therefore essential. He's had a radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer, but now he's having constitutional symptoms as well. So he's having weight loss. 
all of that, I think you don't even need anything else from the STEM to know that this is a worrying cause of back, um, of back pain. And what you need to do is rule out the most important thing first. And it sounds like it could be metastatic um, prostate cancer. He's apyrexial, which helps us lean against dis discitis. Um, you would expect someone to have a vignette here of who's IVDU, who's having fevers, who's maybe having night sweats, and it would be that sort of history. So again, it's leaning against that. There's midline tenderness in his thoracic spine. That is the red flag here. Thoracic back pain is always a red flag, no matter really what the age is. Neurological examination is normal. I think that that can make you then think, oh, well, actually, common is common. Could this be a mechanical back pain? But given the clinical vignette, it's really less likely. So run through them. We've talked a little bit about mechanical back pain. Mechanical back pain is actually is a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't want to jump into that as a diagnosis when you've got really clear red flag symptoms. Metastatic cancer, as we've discussed, is by far the most appropriate answer, given his um, history of prostate cancer, his constitutional symptoms and now his thoracic back pain. Discitis, again, I would expect this to be a vignette that's a, potentially a younger person who's IVDU or someone who's immunocompromised, they're diabetic or they've got HIV or AIDS and they would be pyrexial and they would have very, very localised um, tenderness and you would pick that up on examination. Ankylosing spondylitis, this is your 20 year old man who's got back pain with morning stiffness. Whenever I see an SBA about ankylosing spondylitis, it's always that stem. So really watch out for that because those are really easy marks. And then finally with spinal stenosis, this is actually a, can be a really tricky SBA and a really tricky stem. It sounds a lot like claudication, so peripheral arterial disease. They say that they get pain on walking and then it stops. But what is really important with spinal stenosis is there's a postural aspect to it. So they'll say they have symptoms and other neurological symptoms like paresthesia or bending the neck or bending the back, or that these symptoms are relieved in particular positions. And that's how you can also differentiate it from prefer um, peripheral arterial disease. So I imagine, Priyash, there aren't any questions on this at the moment. And if there isn't, we'll move on. So we've talked a little bit about this, but red flags for back pain. I wouldn't wrote learn um, this list, but it's just important that when you come across them, um, you really, um, they kind of spike your interest. Realize that I've got nocturnal written twice, so please forgive that. Red flags for back pain is basically also what you can use to prove or disprove your theory that this is mechanical back pain. If it's someone who's really young, it's really quite unlikely, especially, and, and also if someone's much older, if someone's more than 55, around 60, and they come in with new back pain, does anyone know what that should also really get you thinking about? Has anyone posted that in the chat? Feel free to use the chat, by the way. It'll be much better if we can, um, if we can talk as we go through. Has anyone put anything? No, no worries. Someone, if someone, someone's put MM, probably for yes. myeloma. Yes, absolutely. If someone's 60, yeah, someone's around 60 years old and they come in with back pain, you should think myeloma. And I think that people often forget that as well. And we see that I'm on GP at the moment and you see that in GP land a lot that actually you, you would think that you'd have the classic hypercalcemia symptoms that you'd have their renal function, it'd be off and they'd come in really breathless from the fatigue, but actually back pain is really, really common um, presenting complaint for myeloma. Acute onset in the elderly, it's also really important in the context of degenerative disc disease. You need to look for any neurology. Constant progressive nocturnal is always worrying. And night pain, especially in younger people and especially in children, always makes you think about an underlying malignancy. Exacerbated by lying supine, I think is also talking to us about spinal stenosis and that postural um, element. Constitutional symptoms and history of malignancy is self-explanatory. You're worried about like metastatic spinal cord compression um, or like metastatic spinal disease. Abdominal mass is kind of is under the malignancy and then thoracic back pain, which is what that SBA was um, testing there. In terms of morning stiffness, I find that the inflammatory back pain stems are really focused on ankylosing spondylitis, like we talked about. Um, and bilateral alternating leg pain, neurological signs, sphincter disturbance. This is when you're thinking about your cordura equina. So have you had like sudden onset or like gradual progressive lower, li lower limb weakness? Do you have fecal 
incontinence or do you have urinary retention which is talking about sphincter disturbance and then also do they have um like saddle anesthesia and i always really worried about how to ask this during my oski exams but actually the best way that i found out as i've kind of started practicing is that you just ask when you wipe when you go to the bathroom um, have you noticed any change in sensation and people really understand that so if you're practicing for oskis as well trying to get that into your um kind of back pain history is really important immunosuppressants like we talked about but don't forget the diabetics are immunocompromised and you see discitis in these patients that's really what it's picking apart here and then leg claudication exercise induced weakness or numbness that's again your spinal stenosis which is kind of does crop up occasionally in sbas and i think it can be quite tricky so i think that's back pain done so this is a mnemonic i think from quesmed about remembering cancers that commonly metastasize to the bone. I think I was in my fourth year at medical school and I had this very serious um, consultant, um, oncology consultant who gave us a mnemonic which has really stuck with me. So it says cancers that metastasize to the bone are all the Bs. So it's breast, brung, bidney, prostate and thyroid and I know that sounds really stupid but um, it's really stuck with me as well. So either use that mnemonic or the um, all the cancers that metastasize to the bone start with a B when they really don't anyway. So this is our next one. I'll read it out because I felt a bit silly last time just sitting here. So this one is a 34 year old woman presents to her GP with pain in her hands. She describes pain in the small joints and the wrists over the last year, worse in the mornings. Systems review reveal no other current issues. On examination, you see inflammation at the CMC, MCP and PIP joints, which are notably warm and tender on both hands. No skin changes are visible. Given the most likely diagnosis, which of the following antibody tests are most specific? So your ANA, your rheumatoid factor, antibody screen is likely to be negative, antihistone antibody or anti-CCP. And yeah, Priyash, I'm not actually seeing the poll results for some unbeknownst reasons. If you can read them out, that would be grand. Okay, so we have most people have gone for E and a couple people have gone for A. Okay, okay. Well, excellent, because the majority got it right. This is, again, they do get much harder as we go along. But the reason that these SBAs are in these slides is because they always come up. And from my experience, especially at London medical schools, although I only have experience of one, they really like antibodies, especially with rheumatology, because it's basically just testing, have you done your learning? So it's anti-CCP, and we're gonna go through why um, in a couple of minutes, but we'll just talk about this STEM. Someone put in the chat, what, what is this? This is an absolutely barn door clinical vignette for what? Rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, absolutely. It's a young woman. She's got a symmetrical inflammatory polyarthropathy with no skin signs um, and no other, what it seems, extra articular um, features. You can get inflammatory osteoarthritis, which is something that's a bit more MRCP and a bit, a bit more postgraduate. But given that she says she's got worse in the mornings, that's hinting at morning stiffness. This is going to be rheumatoid arthritis. For those who put A, I think they put anti-nuclear antibody, or for those who put rheumatoid factor, again, I think what maybe you misread was what is the most specific. We'll talk a little bit more about specificity and sensitivity in the later slides. But essentially, anti-CCP is much more specific for rheumatoid arthritis than rheumatoid factor. If you had a room of 100 people, all of which had rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid factor is more likely to be positive in more of them than anti-CCP. But if you had a room of 100 people who didn't have rheumatoid arthritis, the chance that they're anti-CCP positive is much less likely. So actually anti-CCP is much better, at, for example, ruling things out. So that's basically what the specificity and sensitivity tells us. So when you have a rheumatoid factor that's positive and an anti-CCP 
um, positive with a high titer, the likelihood of that person having rheumatoid arthritis is incredibly high. You don't have to worry too much about titers at this stage, but once you go to F1 and F2, and especially if you've got a rheumatology placement, how positive the antibody is becomes increasingly important. So I believe we have another question. So I think we're talking a little bit about inflammatory arthropathies now and rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a 55 year old female with severe rheumatoid arthritis who presents to her GP with a cough productive of green sputum, which has been getting worse over the past few days. She has felt more unwell, on examination, coarse crackles are heard in the right upper zone and the area is dull to percussion. Her spleen is palpable. She's febrile. She's borderline tacky. She has lower oxygen saturations than we would like. And her blood tests show that she is anemic. She's got a normal white cell count. Her neutrophils are low. And she's probably, I don't know, probably got a little bit of an AKI. Which of the following is the most likely unifying diagnosis? Pleurisy pneumonitis, pleural effusion, Felty syndrome, or amyloidosis? So 80% have gone for D and then a few for the other options. I'm impressed by that. It might have been a uh, diagnosis of exclusion, but absolutely right. This is, this is Felty syndrome. And just as a note, it only exists in SBA land. I mean, obviously, I've only done my rheumatology placement, but when I spoke to rheumatologists, Felty syndrome is really, really rare. It's basically a rare extra articular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis, where you get this triad of splen splenomegaly, neutropenia, and then recurrent infections. This, I think, is the only thing is, is that actually, if this said what is the most likely diagnosis, I probably would have gone for a, a community acquired pneumonia, although her neutrophils are a bit low because it's so vanishingly rare. But the unifying diagnosis is how can we pull all of these sort of strings together is this is Felty syndrome. I did a little bit of reading on the pathophysiology of it because I like that, but it's apparently extremely unclear. Um, you get the neutropenia. So this is why it's complicated by a, a community acquired pneumonia. And you get a splenomegaly, which also can contribute to a thrombocytopenia like you would have in liver disease. When someone has a splenomegaly, you basically get a sequestration um, crisis where all of the um, like platelets, some um, red blood cells and some white cells, they all just get taken up um, by the spleen, lead, leading sometimes to a pancytopenia. This anemia of chronic disease is really important to pick up because I think some people forget that rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory condition. You have lots of constitutional sim symptoms. People commonly come in extremely fatigued. They can sometimes have like low grade pyrexias. And part and parcel of that is that you can have an anemia of chronic disease and these people can be quite poorly with it. So yes, this is Felty syndrome. So we've talked a little bit about rheumatoid arthritis already. Like I said before, this is a symmetrical, polyarticular, usually the small joints of the hand, inflammatory arthritis. You will get in an acute flare, you will get like your MCPs, your PIPs, and sometimes even your wrist joints as well. You will get an active synovitis. And by an active synovitis, I mean that the joints, they are red, they are swollen, they are boggy. You're unlikely to get this in an OSCE. You're more likely to have, especially if you're in some of the London universities, you're more likely to have a chronic, long-standing kind of refractory rheumatoid arthritis patient who has these sorts of signs on examination and get really, really, really used to um, be able to accurately describe what you're seeing here. So if you're able just to drop into the chat what are you seeing at the bottom bottom right with those fingers? What is that deformity called? Or one of them? You can give me a few. Get some swan necking. Yeah, exactly. Swan necking. Anything else? Ulnar deviation. Yes, ulnar deviation of the MCPs. Anything else as well? You can't really see it there, but I'm going to give for anyone who can see my mouse. What do we think that probably is? Someone's put a boot on your ears. Um, yes, yes, but um, you can as well. Swan necking is something I'd be, you can get boot on your ears. Swan necking is more common. But and then the Z-shaped thumbs. Yeah, your Z thumbs. Just get really, they could even show you photos of someone with rheumatoid arthritis and have a normal hand exam. So really just be really slick on how you describe. And 
be clear that you can have an acute flare of the rheumatoid arthritis where you have your synovitis, but actually it takes a really long time of uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis to get these long-standing hand changes that we see here. And actually it's becoming more and more rare to see these sorts of patients. So I wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised if they bought them in for because they're really stable patients as well. C-spine involvement here, again, isn't actually just academic. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they can have atlantoaxial subluxation. And there is this rumor, and I don't know how true it is, that they had a rheumatoid arthritis patient at a hospital, not in the last five to 10 years, and an anaesthetist did a jaw thrust on them and gave them a spinal cord injury because they went completely and did a like a hemisection through the spinal cord. So it's a surgery question. It does happen. Be aware of it. And the extra articular features, if you're doing history taking from someone who you think has an inflammatory or rheumatological condition, the most common thing that people forget are the extra articular features. So. This is rheumatoid arthritis, a few of our investigations. We've talked about a full blood count. We've talked about an anemia of chronic disease. These people can come in with fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea. Inflammatory markers are really useful, especially in an acute flare. You do see the CRP and ESR raised, and you can have like a reactive um, leukocytosis. Rheumatoid factor is what they tend to do first line. And um, like we said, it doesn't confirm it, but it's important in terms of sensitivity. It's also important to say that actually rheumatoid factor is a poor prognostic factor. And we'll talk a little bit about it in more detail as well. But if you're rheumatoid factor positive, you're also more likely to get certain extra articular manifestations. So if you have rheumatoid nodules on your elbows, that actually means that you are rheumatoid factor positive. It's universal. Anti-CCP, we've said, is even more specific. Doesn't confirm it, but what you'll learn from rheumatology is actually anti antibodies don't confirm anything. Rheumatology is all about clinical context. So we get calls all the time from GPs being like, oh, their ANA is weakly positive. And then you ask, do they have any rheumatological signs or symptoms? And they don't. And then we just say, forget it. So rheumatology is always about hardcore bedside medicine. So have you taken a really good history? Have you done a really good examination? And this is also why it cro crops up in OSCE so much. We said we talk about sensitivity and specificity. So let's use, because it comes up again in exams as well, let's talk about D-dimer. At my medical school, what you tended to have, and I had this in one of my earlier year OSCEs, you had a patient come in talking about getting, a, have, worried about having a PE and wanting to have a D-dimer done um, because they wanted to confirm that they had a PE. And what you had to do is try and explain in layman terms about uh, D-dimer sensitivity and specificity, but then also talk a little bit about why it just wouldn't be appropriate in this case. So sensitivity broadly is how good is a test at correctly identifying people with a disease. So with D-dimer, if you took a room of 100 people, every single person in that room had a PE or a DVT, it would be a pretty weird room. If you did do that, how many of those people would have a positive D-dimer? And the answer is, in terms of a D-dimer, almost everyone. Um, and that's why, because it's really, really, really sensitive. In terms of specificity, specificity is how good is a test at correctly identifying those without a disease. So if you took 100 people just randomly and you put them in a, or let's say take them from hospital, you put them in a room and you know that they didn't have a VT, didn't have VTE, and you did a D-dimer on them, how many of them would have a positive D-dimer? And the answer is also quite a lot of them. So it's got a really poor specificity because as we know, D-dimer is raised in a whole host of other things, in inflammatory conditions, such as rheumatological conditions, in infection, in malignancy, in people who are just unwell, in people who've just had surgery. And that's why, D-dimer is really, really, really bad at ruling out people for having a DBT or a PE. Does that make sense? You might, I'm really sorry if I'm spoon feeding that to you, but sometimes it's quite good just to work out how you say it before um, an exam and really get your head around rather than just like rote learning the calculations, think what actually is the sensitivity and specificity and what is it trying to test? Are there any questions on that Priyash or can we move on? Nope, no questions. 
Brilliant. Perfect. So joint x-rays, they crop up again and again and again, especially OA. In terms of rheumatoid arthritis, what is the giveaway is they will tell you that they've got probably erosions. And that means juxta articular means kind of adjacent, just adjacent to the um, to the joint itself. You see here, you get these really, really, really little erosions. And that's what it's talking about. You can get periarticular osteoporosis, but actually it's more commonly osteope osteopenia. You can see that on an x-ray as well. And then over time, you get this narrowing of joint space and you get this sort of deforming arthritis. Soft tissue swelling is something that you can pick up really early, but actually ultrasound is the best modality for imaging for a synovitis. So what you'll see commonly um, in rheumatology placements or when you're on the wards yourself is that actually ultrasound is more and more commonly used to look at a in inflammatory or infected joint. Right, so again, we've talked a little bit about this please don't forget this when you're doing a history examination for a rheumatological condition. I would go demographics. So are they a young man with back pain? Then you'd go presenting complaint, but always go, oh, this is a rheumatological condition. I need to ask about everything else. And if you're doing a systems review, you won't forget it, but just remember. Systemic symptoms I've put in red because they are actually really, really, really common. So you're getting low grade pyrexias, you're getting weight loss and you're getting fatigue. And it's usually over quite a long period of time up to about like you can have six months, months before. Then you think eyes, always eyes in rheumatological conditions. Most commonly it's episcleritis and scleritis, but you can also get sicker symptoms, which is your dry, gritty eyes. Your anemia of chronic disease, we've talked a little bit about. We've talked about splenomegaly. We've talked about Felty syndrome. We've talked about rheumatoid nodules basically being pathognomic that you're rheumatoid factor positive. So what I want to talk a little bit more about now is the chest. You get um, fibrosis. And does anyone know whether it's upper or lower zone fibrosis? Has anyone put in? Someone's put lower. Yeah, well, actually, now I'm thinking about it. I can't remember. The mnemonic is breasts and Dr. CIA. I have a feeling that it's uh, actually upper zones. I think the R for lower zones is radiation. But if I'm fact-checked about that, please do do some furious Googling now. Pleural effusions are actually really rare, but you can get them associated with pleurisy. So you basically get irritation of the pleura and you get this sort of pleuritic chest pain. I'm actually glad that they don't have um, pulmonary nodules here because they are so vanishingly rare. They don't really exist. Um, but if someone's got hemoptysis and RA, fine. You can think about answering that as the answer to the question. Again, pericardial effusions, peripheral neuropathy um, and Raynaud's, they also do happen, but these are more of your weirder and wonderful. Um, so just keep those at the back of your mind and amyloidosis. I mean, it's very, a very house diagnosis, but if you've got this multi-system, if you have multi-system organ failure, so I'm talking, do they have heart failure? Do they have renal failure? And you can't quite put this together, but they've got this background of this inflammatory condition. Think, could this be secondary amyloid? Primary amyloid is usually related to multiple myeloma or, um, I think you can get it with like Waldenstrom's, but secondary myeloma is usually as a result of a long-term inflammatory condition. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, you can even get it with diabetes and that's your amyloidosis. And amyloidosis actually just refers to misfolded proteins. They're not quite like prions, but they're misfolded proteins that just deposit everywhere and they just cause, fa cause failure of different organs. Right, next question. A 34 year old man comes to the GP in winter because his fingers get painful in the cold. He describes paresthesia in his fingertips. On examination in the consultation room, you notice dilated capillaries at the nail bed. There is no color change at the fingertips, but he describes a demarcated line beyond which his fingertips turn pale in cold weather. He has attended the GP three times in the last month with cramping pain in the sole of his feet. His history is significant for smoking. On examination, the pedal pulses are absent. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Erythromyalgia, Raynaud's disease, Berger's disease, cervical rib, cryoglobulinemia. So we've got a pretty much a 50-50 split between B and C. 
okay, okay. I actually completely understand that. So the answer is Berger's disease, but I understand completely why people put raynodes. So Berger's disease is also known as thromboangitis obliterans, which is a non-atherosclerotic vasculitis, which is an inflammatory condition in small and medium-sized arteries. When we say it's non-atherosclerotic, we would imagine that if this were an older person, this person was 60, they were a vascular path, you would imagine that they were actually occluding their small and medium-sized arteries because they had atherosclerosis and they were throwing off big plaques. This means that this is not related to atherosclerosis and is actually due to the inflammatory disorder itself. It's always in the stem. It's always about young male smokers. Um, and they can be Mediterranean, they can be Middle Eastern in origin, but I wouldn't let that deter you. It's young male smokers. And this patient has actually presented with quite a few things. So I'll just go back to the line. So you're absolutely right. He is presenting with Raynaud's. Those changes in the, well, kind of with raynaud like symptoms. So they're turning cold in the winter, which I can understand makes you think about that. But that doesn't explain this cramping pain in the sole of his feet. And it doesn't explain why his pedal pulses are absent. You don't get that in Raynaud's. What it is suggesting is that there is a systemic problem um, with his vasculature. So patients with burgers can present really acutely with acutely ischemic limb. And they don't actually have to have that background of peripheral claudication because they're not slowly atherosclerosing their um, arteries off. We have a patient in one of my um, hospitals who has Berger's disease. It's actually a young Caucasian woman who has continued to smoke with Berger's disease and she's slowly having amputations. So at the beginning of my placement here, she um, placement up in Leeds, she had one of her, I think it was her left leg amputated. Then she's had her right leg amputated. Now she's having her fingers amputated as well. And it's because she's not smoke. It's because she's still smoking. They think it's like a hypersensitivity reaction um, to nicotine. So the most important thing that you can do for someone with um, burgers is that they should never smoke. And you can give vasoactive medications like you would give in Raynaud's as well, like nifedipine, just to open up the peripheral vasculature to improve blood supply. Um, in, improve blood supply. Critical ischemia, you're going back to your vascular lectures um, and you're thinking that patient needs hospital admission. They are going to need a um, vascular review. They can go and debride gangrenous tissue or they can try and open up um, the occluded arteries. So it's quite a small print, Berger's disease, and it's commonly also in stems called thromboangitis obliterans. So just make sure that you're aware that they're both the same thing. Are there any questions about that? And the reason this isn't Raynaud's is because you don't have the classical color changes where they go white, blue, and then a reactive red because you get hyperemia. Um, but it does give a Raynaud's like picture because you are having um, peripheral vasoconstriction. The difference is here, they're also having claudication and he's got absent peripheral pulses um, in the affected limbs. Does that all make sense? And the way that you can diagnose it is um, you can do MRA or CTA. And basically that shows you that there's no atherosclerotic plaque. Um, so it's unlikely that this is like a familial hypercholesterolemia in a young person and that it's more likely to be something like Berger's disease. If there are no questions about that, we'll keep going and I won't read the questions out. So we've got about two thirds of people have gone for D and then it's relatively even spread outside of that. And we also just have one question asking, is pain more of a feature of Raynaud's than Berger's? I think that's tricky because what's causing the pain is ischemia regardless. So the pain I imagine is really similar. Um, I would imagine though that the stem is really different. 
I think we have some questions on Raynaud's coming up. Raynaud stems either say that this is a primary Raynaud, so this is a young, usually woman, who just comes with that classical colour change and pain, but it's white, blue, red, and no other symptoms. It might be a secondary Raynaud, so it might be re related to like a cryoglobulinemia or a hematological malignancy, in which case you'll have your other symptoms and, and symptoms and signs leans, leaning towards that. With burgers, you get kind of like this vascular path picture where they look like they've got peripheral artery disease, they've got critical ischemia, and um, they've got this sort of peripheral vasoconstriction or peripheral ischemia as well. If I had to guess, I imagine that burgers would be more painful, um, but pain can definitely be a feature of both stems. Real. So most people put D here. Priyash, what was the split? Was it quite a large proportion of people put D or was it quite um, quite mixed? Just, just over 60%. Okay, interesting. So yeah, this is a lady with a history of hemochromatosis. It's swollen, warm and tender. You kind of know this or you don't, um, but hemochromatosis is associated with pseudo gout and that's what this is testing here. So I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about gout now and differentiating between them. It's not septic arthritis because you'll get you'll get a much better stem of this they'll probably lean towards the cocker's criteria so they're febrile they can't put any weight on it they've got a risk factor like they've had a recent injury or their ivdu rheumatoid arthritis we've already seen the stem it's usually a younger woman with a symmetrical peripheral polyarthropathy they're not going to have like an oligoarthritis or a, mo a monoarthritis acute gout is the best differential from here but this is an older woman with hemochromatosis so you bet your bottom dollar that they're pushing for pseudo gout it also could be osteoarthritis i i think that's fine um but again given that she's got hemochromatosis and it's swollen, warm and tender in undergraduate land. That's an inflammatory arthropathy rather than an acute flare of an osteoarthritis. I don't know if I said knee before, but it is risk that she's come in with. OK, so we'll talk a little bit now more about gout and pseudo gout. So gout and pseudo gout are inflammatory arthropathies as well. Um, to the sense that you get this sort of inflammatory synovitis that causes significant pain. Gout is really common and gout always comes up in exams and always comes up as I like could, it, it, it always can come up as like a GP OSCE station when you're talking about like managing risk factors as well and conservative management at home. Basically, you get a disorder of purine metabolism. So you basically either can't get rid of enough uric acid. So you've got CKD or you're taking thiazides or you've got overproduction. So you're eating lots of like red meat, drinking lots of beer. The synovitis is because you get this sort of like these craggy urate crystals that deposit actually in the joint and they really irritate the synovial um, kind of covering. Really risk factors, as we guess we've talked about, you're older, you're male, you've got CKD, obesity, or you've got you've started taking a diuretic, which is usually a thiazide. Be just keep note of the thiazide point, because, again, that always crops up. Does anyone know what these photos are trying to get you to think about? You can kind of see it there, I think. And there. Just while we're waiting, we also have another question. How does hemochromatosis cause pseudogout? What is the pathophysiology behind it? That's a really good question. <laughs> it's a bit, bit far beyond my time. I think it, I might be completely wrong. So we'll come on to pseudogout, but pseudogout is also a disorder of like calcium metabolism as well. You get like chondrocalcinosis. So you get that line in between the joints. And I think with hemochromatosis as well, you get like para, parathyroid um, disorders and you basically get dysregulation of calcium and PTH and phosphate and I think that predispos predisposes you to pseudo gout again fact check me on that because that's really pushing me back to my pathophysiology but I have a feeling it's something to do with that it is what I can confirm that's correct you um, think it's is that right excellent yes. okay, good. Um, someone someone has put is this tophaceous gout yeah, 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 exactly. This is tophaceous gout. Again, it's unlikely that you'll get it, but they just look like, I can imagine you could get this photo in an exam and you could be like, blimmin' hell, I have no idea what that is. Um, so tophaceous gout, you get 
kind it looks almost like the calcinosis that you might get in scleroderma um but it tends to be over obviously an inflamed joint and the joint itself can be deformed because if you've got tophaceous gout you probably had gout in that joint a lot so gout just get really quite confident and comfortable in talking about the investigations into gout and also the management so if someone's come in with a red hot swollen joint you, what you have to rule out first is septic arthritis. You can do the Cocker's criteria for that. It's really useful and it gives you a likelihood that it is a septic arthritis or not. And then based on that, you can kind of come up with your management plan. If you're highly suspicious this is a septic arthritis, um, this is someone's first presentation, they've just come in with a red hot swollen knee, they're probably gonna need an aspiration. Um, and you see this done so many times on um, in hospitals and co more commonly than not, it's gout or pseudo gout. And what you should also remember, because this crops up in every single uh, SBA exam, is what you find. If it's gout, you get like negative needle shaped crystals under biorefringence or whatever. If it's pseudo gout, you get positive rhomboid shaped needles. Just wrote learn it. it. It comes up. It's not worth losing the mark over. We've talked a little bit about the clinical features. It's usually an oligoarthritis. It's usually like the first MTP joint, but you can also get it in the knee, elbow, ankle, wrist. They can also happen at times of stress as well that you can have a gout flare. X-rays are not that useful. If you've got, like I said, if you've got a red hot swollen joint, it's clinical examination and you're probably going to tap it with or without ultrasound. And we've talked a little bit about the pseudo gout and the crystals as well. The management of gout, this is a nice slide, but what I would say here is actually you should split it into two. Oh, they have actually. So you need to think about the acute management of gout after you've ruled out a septic arthritis, and then you need to think about the chronic management as well. In the acute, um, in the acute context, you've got to think about pain relief. It's exquisitely painful. Not that I've had it before, but it is apparently exquisitely painful. So first thing, first line is usually non-steroidals, but there are so many contraindications. Pop down in the chat as well, and Priyash can keep an eye on it. In which people would we probably not give a non-steroidal? People with peptic ulcer disease? Absolutely. That's a great one. People with peptic ulcer disease, people with um, CKD, people who are on things as well, like aspirin and an SSRI. And if you put an NSAID in as well, they might, and they're elderly, they might have an upper GI bleed. And also for people who are on anticoagulants, more often than not, people are actually really hesitant to give non-steroidals. So I see that culture scene is given much, much, much more frequently now than non-steroidals. Culture scene, does anyone know what you have to warn a patient about? As a, and if you're saying this in an exam, you will look so slick and so above your level if you can warn them about the side effect diarrhea yeah diarrhea exactly basically if you take culture scene you do get diarrhea so you have to warn patients because you give them a three-day course they get diarrhea they stop after one day and then they're never on top of the gout flare steroids we can use but again we really don't like using them especially these lots of these patients are like ckd they might be vascular paths as well a lot of them um, have high BMIs, so we don't really want to give short steroid courses. We can give intraarticular steroids, but in reality, that's not what you give to manage an acute um, acute gout flare. Management of gout is again something that really comes up quite commonly in OSCE stations, and this is when it's really getting you to talk about conservative primary care management. So your lifestyle modification is your alcohol intake, your purine rich foods. You can learn a list if you'd like. Um, you can do a medication review. So are they taking thiazide, diuretics? And elderly patients often are because of the um, it doesn't drop your calcium as much. Urate lowering therapy is really is really interesting. They used to say if there are like multiple attacks in one year, but actually more and more now they're saying that after your initial gout flare, you can consider starting urate lowering therapy. Um, so just keep aware of that guideline because I think more and more it's leaning towards everyone who has gout should be on allopurinol. Starting allopurinol at least two weeks after the last attack is fully resolved is really important. When you give allopurinol, you can actually cause a flare of gout. You can kind of force the urate um, to kind of precipitate into joints. So you always, when you're starting a urate lowering therapy, you also cover with non-steroidals, you cover with colchicine to stop an acute flare. 
And this is an important point. You never, ever stop allopurinol once it's started. Um, you always keep it on and you can just give them colchicine or a non-steroidal on top. This isn't in the slides, I don't think. I just wanted to ask, what do people think about someone coming in, red hot joint, you're seeing them in like elderly AMU and your consultant asks you to do a year rate level? What do we think about that? Any thoughts? Urate can be normal in the events of an acute flare, and oh, so it can be falsely raised in elderly patients. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Absolutely. The first point um, is the one that I was actually getting towards. Exactly right. Urate, once it precipitates in joints, your serum level can be low. It can be useful, and I've seen it done. If someone's got like rip, roaring gout flare, um, you're going to do a urate, it's going to be high anyway. But you could, when someone's had a gout flare, you do a urate level. And because all of the urate crystals are in the joint, they're not in the serum anymore. So it looks like it might not be gout then. So they usually say, wait four to six weeks after the resolution of a gout attack and then check your urate and then think about starting urate lowering therapy. Um, but that's just more of a small print. But yeah, it's a bit of a pernickety thing. But if a urate can be falsely negative um, in an acute gout flare. Right, next question. Okay, so most people have gone for B. B, excellent, excellent, excellent. Absolutely right. So if you've got uh, onchylysis, then you know that this is psoriatic arthropathy. And again, I think just putting all these inflammatory arthropathies back to back, what it can show that actually there are very clear different vignettes and what they include in it is on purpose. So it's a 45 year old lady, one month history of joint pains, but it's the DIP joints now. And it is a symmetrical polyarthropathy. Actually, psoriatic arthropathy can be kind of anything. You can get like an oligoarthritis, but these DIP joints, um, the DIP joints are really what's important here. If this had said, another thing they sometimes give you is they give you that one whole digit is swollen and that's your dactylitis and then you're like ding 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 this must be psoriatic arthropathy she's got her raised dry dry rash on the extensor surfaces of her knees and elbows again it's not a very specific um description of the rash but it's extensor it's look sounds a little bit scaly and she's not unwell this is going to be psoriatic arthropathy we'll have questions on the other ones and we've gone through a bit of it but rheumatoid nodules i've already waxed lyrical about rheumatoid arthritis and they have to be rheumatoid factor positive got runs papules We'll talk about that because that's one of my favorite um, diseases, which makes me sound like a freaky nerd, but it's really cool. And then gouty tophi, we've talked about, we've seen a photo of it. This description doesn't fit. And then joint crepitus is fine, maybe, but that would you'd expect after someone's had years and years and years and years of inflammatory arthropathy. And it's led to like deforming degenerative change. So this is onculysis. And I'll show you here. These nail changes here, that's what it's talking about. You basically are falling apart of the, of the nails. What you can see as well, and I've seen before, is you can get pitting. So what you do is, if you can imagine, or you can look it up, you get really tiny little dots at the end of the nails, um, and usually the distal bit of the nail bed. And that is pitting that's also associated with psoriatic arthritis. Well, psoriatic arthropathy. So what we've done here is we've had a bit of a whiz stop tour of your seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Rheumatoid arthritis is seropositive. You have rheumatoid factor positive and you most often than not also have anti-CCP positive. Seronegative spondyloarthropathies is when someone is HLA B27 positive. And this is basically a genetic predisposition towards having an inflammatory arthropathy. So your immune system isn't that good. Um, you sometimes have a random trigger, can be an infection, it can be IBD. And then what your body does is your body by accident starts attacking the joints. That's base, That's all that it means. 
We haven't talked much about ankylosing spondylitis, but I believe that it's coming up. So we'll leave it for now. Reactive arthritis. This is your classic. Sorry to all the men who are listening. But your classic stem is you're an 18 year old boy. You've gone to Ibiza with your mates and you've come back and you can't see, you can't pee and you can't climb a tree. And that's your, your reactive arthritis. It's usually either UTI. So I think it can be E. coli as well, but it's more commonly than not they're talking to you about the um, about chlamydia. You treat as well by inducing remission, so you can either give non steroidals for the pain, and sometimes you need a short course of steroids. But you also have to treat the underlying infection as well. But actually, more commonly than not, in reactive arthritis, you've cleared the infection by the time that um, you're presenting kind of with the reactive arthropathy. So you don't, you never get like a positive MCNS. It's not a septic arthritis. You tend to just get like white cells in the um, synovial fluid. You don't ever pick up a bug. Enteropathic arthropathy is really interesting. You can commonly get like a sacroiliitis associated with IBD. And if you treat and get on top of the IBD, you tend to get resolution of the enteropathic arthropathy as well. We've talked about psoriatic arthritis. It's usually a symmetrical DIP um, joint polyarthritis. Um, you get nail changes, you get your pitting we've talked about, you get your onchiolysis, you get what's called an axial spondyloarthropathy as well. So you get a sacral, ali um, a sacral ileitis and also you can get pain in the spine itself, similar to ankspond. Um, and again, treatment is try and get on top of the acute flare. Um, and then if you really struggle, you can use things like methotrexate or cyclosporin for someone who has really difficult psoriatic arthritis. So I can't quite remember what these photos are. I'm not sure what the right bottom one is. Oh, maybe it's just, hmm, not sure. Anyway, could someone tell me what one, two, and maybe three are? Maybe you can help me with that one. What is one pointing at this one here? If I show you these little bits, are they normal? Got some bamboo spine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Exactly. That's bamboo spine. It's not the usual one you get because you usually get the um, like anterior view. So this is like the lateral spinal view. But you get these syndesmophytes that kind of it's ossification of ligaments between the spine so you basically get that re physical reduced mobility because your spine is becoming stiffer and stiffer and stiffer like a bamboo spine what is this one this one's a bit of a hard one but it does come up in sbas not to be mistaken for palmar plus pustular psoriasis Nope. Might not Nothing in the chat. Oh, keratin, keratin, oh, keratoderma yes. blenorajicum. Yes, yes, yes. Whoever put that. Excellent. Keratoderma blenorajicum. It's associated with reactive arthritis. So you basically, it looks a lot apparently like palmar pustular psoriasis, um, but it's typically on the bottom of the feet. You get like this waxy brown, yellow um, discoloration. And I think you can get little pustules as well. And that's associated, one of the like extra articular manifestations of reactive arthritis. And then I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure what they're getting at. Maybe that's the talk, that's psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. Oh, fine. So yeah, that's your psoriatic arthritis because you've got your onchiolysis, your nail changes, you've got really, really deformed DI, um, like distal, um, joint there. And you've got all of this swelling. I think that's quite tricky because that's not so much a dactylitis. The dactylitis, you'd expect just the whole digit to be swollen. But I mean, it looks painful, doesn't it? Right. Oh, yeah, dactylitis. Perfect. Well done to everyone. And next one. And I will hurry up because I know you all will want thing to do things with your Thursday evening.
So we've got 60% going for B and about 25% going for A. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. I actually feel really sorry for the people who went A, because I know exactly why you did. And we'll talk about that a bit more. But B, muscle biopsy is correct. So this is a 57 year old man. He has proximal muscle weakness. There is no skin involvement and he has reduced proximal power. He has no past medical history of significance and already screened him for a vitamin D deficiency. That's good, isn't it? What is this most likely to be? So I imagine everyone or almost 85, 90 percent of people know that this is polymyositis. This is not dermatomyositis because there isn't any of your telltale dermatological signs. But this is polymyositis, which is basically an autoimmune mediated muscle problem. So I understand why people put A and you, you, you're really on the right track. But I think what this is here, it's looking for definitive diagnosis and definitive diagnosis is always through a muscle biopsy. In reality, when I've seen dermatomyositis and polymyositis, if you've got enough evidence, they don't put people through a muscle biopsy because when you give them steroids, they get better. You, you then identify the underlying cause of it and they don't actually go through the muscle biopsy. You also don't delay steroids. Um, a lot of the time when you're treating someone for polymyositis or dermatomyositis. And if you have steroids for a few days, that can impact the um, outcome of the muscle biopsy itself. So I feel sorry for people who put A, but it is B. So this is, I know this is really lame, but this is one of my favorite um, diseases. I kid you not, where was an acute medical, um, I was doing one of my acute medical takes and I was on rheumatology and one of the F1s was like, can you just go and see this patient? I'm a bit, I just, it doesn't seem right. They're treating her as a pneumonia and there's something not right. It feels quite roomy. And I walk in and I kid you not, she sat there with a helotrope rash. She's got Gotron's papules. She's got bi like bilateral symmetrical periungual erythema. And I was like, oh, I was like, how, how have you finding climbing the stairs? And she was like, oh, Lara, I've not climbed the stairs in weeks now. And she was sat on the acute medical ward for about four or five days with dermatomyositis. And um, so you do come across it, vanishingly rare, but it does happen. Um, but maybe if you look for it more, you see it more. But you get your classic discoloration, purplish discoloration of your upper eyelids. You get your Gotron's papules here, um, which sometimes I think can confuse people versus Russell signs, which you see in bulimia. Um, but these are very clear, like roughened, um, patches and they're not just on the index finger which you might suspect in bulimia nervosa they're bilateral on all um knuckles and then this is actually the telltale sign got on papules are good but you see here you get this periungual erythema the only thing that really causes periungual erythema is dermatomyositis or a connective tissue disease so if you see that ever you know that you're going to look extremely um smart when you tell people that you picked up Right. For dermatomyositis or polymyositis, you must always look for an underlying malignancy. And this crops up in SBAs. A lot of the time they'll ask you what else you should do um, to investigate the cause. And they might give you like a colonoscopy. They might give you a CT cap and always lean towards that answer. They're pushing you to know that polymyositis and dermatomyositis are related um, to an underlying malignancy. And in the case of the lady I'm talking about, she was treated for a dermatomyositis. She had a full CT cap. Um, she was basically CT'd head to toe, didn't pick up anything. Then I looked up her notes a few days ago. She was readmitted and now, now suddenly six months later, she came in with breathlessness and she's got like a bilateral symmetrical adenocarcinoma of the lung. So you do actually see it that dermatomyositis and polymyositis actually precede the malignancy. And it's unfortunately a little bit of a warning sign. So next one. Okay, so we've got quite spread here, actually. So 40% have gone for D and then 
20% have gone for C and 20% have gone for E. Excellent. I actually think this is a really, really tricky question. And only a couple of things, I think, give it away. And this is not just a two-step question. I think this is a three-step question. So 42-year-old woman presents to rheumatology. She's got a protracted history of fatigue and pain in multiple joints. She developed a rash on returning from holiday in Spain. And she's got demarcated rash with scales on her face and neck. Given the most likely diagnosis, which of the following is the best ne next best investigation? I think to break this down, this is a 42 year old woman. That is, those demographics are really important. She's got constitutional symptoms and she's got what sounds like a um, oligoarthropathy. And the key giveaway here is that she's got a photosensitive rash. So if I told you that this is a 40 year old woman with fatigue and joint pains and a photosensitive rash, I think that makes it clearer. This is lupus. The next step then is what is the next best investigation? I can understand why people might go skin biopsy, but actually that's not going to yield us a lot. Rheumatology is mostly like at the bedside and that constellation of signs and symptoms tells us this is likely lupus and the way that we're going to actually diagnose that is through antibodies. Blood and urine cultures don't really make sense and I don't think anyone put that. Echocardiogram I also think is a good option. Um, because you can get like a um, pericardial effusion from SLE. What it's picking up here is that this is a lady who is probably unwell with lupus. What you have to find out is whether or not she has lupus nephritis. So does she have hematuria or proteinuria? The best way to do that is on a urine dip. Okay, a 24 hour urine collection, I understand if you're thinking about collecting a load of protein, but actually you would already do like a protein creatinine ratio or a um, ACR. So I think that's why urine dip here is the best answer. Although I do think that the vignette is quite vague. Urine dip. So what I would urge you to think about when you're thinking about lupus is actually that lupus can cause anything like amyloidosis. The giveaways, it's a 40 year old woman or a 20 to 40 year old woman who has come in with fatigue, lots of lots of aches and pains, but she has like a objective, um, a subjective joint pain, but objective, some object, objective small joint signs. Deformity and erosions are rare, but you can get a deforming arthropathy. The most important thing that they will give you in a stem is whether or not they've got a photosensitive rash. I think them saying that it was on the neck in the last vignette complicates it. Because I imagine if they said she has a rash on her face that spares the nasolabial folds, you'll all jump in with the lupus. But actually the photosensitive rash can be anywhere, but is most commonly on the face. It can cause literally anything. Um, it can cause an itis of almost every organ in the body. It can cause any sort of rash, essentially. You can get your discoid lupus when you get alopecia. You can get purpura. You can get a vasculitis associated with it. You can get Raynaud's. You can get just like generalized myalgia, generalized um like generalized fatigue like we've talked about before and you can also get like cns um lupus as well and i've seen that as well where pa patients can get like you can have seizures you can have cranial nerve lesions just from lupus itself so it goes in for me it goes in the same basket as amyloid if you're really not sure what it is but there's a photosensitive rash it's probably lupus um in a young woman if it's you don't know what it is it's causing organ failure all over the shop and there's no photosensitive rash, it might be amyloid. So that's how I think about it. Antibodies in SLE always, always, always come up. So like when we were talking about rheumatoid arthritis and we talk about sensitivity and specificity, first line, you will do an, an autoantibody profile, but ANA is the most sensitive. If you took 100 people who had lupus, almost all of them would be ANA positive. In terms of specificity, the question in the vignette is usually talking about your anti-DS DNA. Um, Anti-Smith antigen I have seen come up, but that's more MRCP part one, tends not to sit so much around in the undergraduate sphere. But again, positive antibodies don't actually mean squat. Um, high titers of anti-DS DNA antibodies are much more specific and much more suggestive of SLE. And they do suggest that the disease activity is worse. And it does also suggest that you're gonna have a worse outcome in lupus nephritis. So it is worth thinking about that, but antibodies in rheumatology are always within context. 
what do think people think think what do people think about um inflammatory markers in, in an sle flare uh, specifically your crp can anyone comment on the chat about that it decreases Oh, it decreases. It might, it might decrease. CRP essentially doesn't rise in an acute SLE flare. So if someone comes in and they've got SLE um, and their CRP is 300, the SLE isn't driving that CRP. So you have to look for another cause, usually an infection because they're probably on immunosuppressants as well. You see that quite a lot commonly. You might be thinking in terms of going down, complement goes down because you. I think your C3 drops because you're obviously you've got the um, activation of complements. You're like churning through all of your complement um, factors. So C3 and C4, I think, drop. CRP doesn't rise in the acute SLE flare. Again, fact check me if I'm wrong, because I'm speaking like uh, with a lot of confidence. Management does depend on severity. Um, and there's actually a massive spectrum in terms of SLE, especially in the terms of lupus nephritis. Hydroxychloroquine is actually really the mainstay of SLE treatment. And that's what I see most people on long term. And you can use non-steroidals for the joint pain to like induce remission. Um, more long, you don't actually need to know the more longer term management on patients that aren't managed on hydroxychloroquine can involve DMARDs, can involve bi biologics. And then cyclophosphamide is a really interesting drug because it can cause hemorrhagic cystitis, which is one of the common side effects of it. But it's really commonly used in rheumatological connective tissue diseases. So used in SLE and it can be used um, when there's lupus nephritis. It can be used in um, things like Wegener's or Churg Strauss or good pastures. Um, and it can be used in things like poly chondritis or whatever but you don't need to know about that um does anyone know i think it's coming up later but just for fun what do you have to monitor if someone's on hydroxychloroquine and if this doesn't come up in one of your finals i will be flabbergasted eyes oh yes eyes what specifically about eyes what's it called retinopathy question it is, yeah it is retinopathy it's called bullseye retinopathy if you look at the retinas of people who are on hydroxychloroquine who have it apparently it looks like a bullseye you think you, you you lose the outer retina so that's what it that's what it looks like so you have to have annual um um like stenon, uh, annual eye tests next one And Priyash, how far through are we now? About, still about 10 more slides to go. Okay, so this time we've got a three-way... Oh, no, we've got... Most people have gone for D, actually. Okay, most people have gone to D. Well, I about fifty percent, and then um, a third of people have gone for B. Yeah, I think this is actually a really hard question, and I thought it was—it's a good one to put in, and it's got a really important learning point. So, this is a thirty-year-old man presents with hemoptysis. That's what he's presenting with. He has had acute onset shortness of breath following a week of a cough. He's also had frank hematuria for the past week. It makes me wonder why he didn't come in sooner. But anyway. On examination, he is ex in spiritual crackles over the lung basis and he looks very pale. His blood sh tests show a urea of 15 and creatinine of 300. Given the most likely diagnosis, which of the following antibodies are present? So this is a 30 year old man who's presented with hemoptysis and he's got he's got pulmonary renal syndrome. He is in AKI stage three. That's renal failure territory. And he's got hemoptysis. So I think that there are two particular um key differentials that you've got in mind here and i actually don't mind if you chose one of the antibodies or the other because i think that they're both good answers but i'll tell you why it's more one than the other this could be granulomatous with polyangitis gpa vagueness could also be anti-gbm um so good pastures the reason why i'm going to say it's not churg strauss is because you get this history of asthma you get this history of eosinophilia and it makes it quite clear that it's that the reason that this is good pastures and not vagueness is actually just a very subtle difference. 
good pastures, you tend to present more with hemoptysis because you um, tend to get um, sort of pulmonary hemorrhages more so than in vagueness and GPA. This is a young man. Again, it means, may, means that it's more likely to be good pastures and they don't have any of this history of um, they don't see they've got like a saddle shaped nose deformity, which you'd expect in GPA. They don't really talk about if it's GPA, you can have like vasculitic rash. You can also get like chronic rhinosinusitis or again, that's more common in Churg Strauss. It's just really picking apart which one is more likely. But this is someone who's got hemoptysis and what is a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So it's either going to be one of your small vessel vasculitis, uh, vasculitides, so your Churg Strauss or your Wagner's, or this is going to be a good pastures. And I think it does just lean slightly more towards good pastures. P anchor antibody is indicative of Churg Strauss and C anchor is GPA. The way I remember it is that the C and the C don't go together. I know that's basically mental but that's the way that I remember it and it's got me through this far anti-streptolysin O that can be used in something like post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis um, and ANA is probably might be positive but it's not useful in this context so oh yes rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis you can spit that into your small vesicle vasculitides so your GPA and your eGPA and then you've also got your anti-GBM, um, good pastures disease. You just split them in half because the pathophysiology is different. Um, so GPA is like a, is the vasculitis. So the blood vessels themselves are um, really inflamed and they necrotize. And they that's what causes um, the renal failure and sometimes the um, kind of sinus involvement and the lung involvement as well. In anti-GBN, what actually happens is you've got an antibody against type 4 collagen. So what happens is the antibodies come in and they deposit against the type 4 collagen that's in the um, like Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. And then that's what causes the renal failure. So that's why it's good to split them in half, even though they can really present quite similarly. GPA, what why it's not that in the last question is because you didn't really get this convincing history of upper or lower airway involvement. You find you had your hemoptysis, but it would usually say like sinusitis, it would say saddle nose deformity because you lose the collagen here. Um, you get a systemic vasculitis, they can get a rash. Um, and then like we said, you're rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Your eGPA, that's your allergic asthma. They'll probably give you an eosinophil count. And then again, you get this sinusitis picture. It's more common in eGPA. And then your good pastures, essentially, you don't really have any of those other vasculitic um, symptoms. You just have pulmonary renal failure. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? No, excellent. And this is useful, and I've seen this in real life, and you might have too. This is your saddle-shaped deformity that you get with vagus, the vasculitis. And I imagine that it's because um, the connective tissue and like collagen in your nose, it's pretty avascular cartilage, is pretty avascular anyway. So when you then lose um, the blood supply because you have um, a vasculitis of small vessels, that's why this collapses. I imagine it's actually quite similar to if you did loads of cocaine because you get a vasoconstriction here. So you lose the connective tissue um, um, and cartilage there. Does anyone know what this X-ray is trying to get you to think about? Oh, nothing in the chat. No, that's all right. It's quite. These are pulmonary nodules. And you can get them in vagueness. So you can get lung involvement, but it is rarer. And these are the pulmonary nodules that you're talking that you're talking predominantly about. Again, small print, not that important. Really quickly, can you just throw into the chat side effects of methotrexate? We'll just take one or two answers. And if you can read them out, Priyash, then we can go through the rest. I've given you hydroxychloroquine anyway, so we won't do that. Pulmonary fibrosis or ulcers. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Pulmonary fibrosis, although actually apparently that's up for debate, but we won't get into that now. Something else. Pardon? Teratogenic and bone marrow suppression and liver toxicity, fatigue. Oh, they're all coming all, in. Yeah, all perfect. Absolutely right. The other thing with methotrexate, 
don't give it with another folate inhibitor. So if you've got your rheumatoid arthritis patient who's on methotrexate, don't give them trimethoprim because then you're going to literally throw them into bone marrow suppression. Excellent. Liver fibrosis is a really, really good one. They, um, these rheumatoid arthritis patients can sometimes become cirrhotic um, and then they can present at, at paces or in, I imagine, a very mean OSCE station at undergraduate level that you've got a rheumatoid arthritis patient who's also got chronic liver disease patients um, signs because they've been taking methotrexate. We've done hydroxychloroquine, so that's your bullseye retinopathy, annual eye tests. Infliximab. What is infliximab, number one? What, how does it work? And number two, what do you have to watch out for? So we've got TNF inhibitor and can cause reactivation of TB. Yes, it can. Reactivation of TB is excellent. It's really important. You have to text before, um, test before. And then it's a, it's a really strong immunosuppressant. So you can you can get really, really sick on infliximab if you get another infection. So it's really important that you counsel a patient on that. And then very, very rarely you can get something called sick, um, sick serum syndrome. Um, but look that up in your own time. It's quite interesting. Non-steroidals we've talked a little bit about. The main things we worry about is like triple whammies in people who have like really bad kidney disease, people who are on anticoagulation or antiplatelets, people who have peptic ulcer disease because it makes it makes them bleed. So that's something we worry about. More and more, though, now we're looking and we're seeing with non-steroidals that it, it can drive hypertension and it actually has increases the cardiovascular risk profile of patients. So we're now being more caution, more cautious in vascular paths and those with established CVD. I'm going to be honest, I cannot remember hardly any of the gold um, side effects if you put them in. I'd be very impressed. I think they can cause bone marrow suppression gold. Um, but who are, we, who are we giving gold to, really? And then steroids, we can go through the whole list, but I'd hope at this point when we're going into finals, um, you'd be quite slick at your corticosteroid um, side effects. So you start from the head. That's how I did it. And I'd run through it. You start from the head and be like, can cause psychosis. It can cause insomnia. It can cause cataracts. can cause thin skin, bruising. can cause a Cushing's-like um syndrome it can cause like um a, a, like obesity it can cause diabetes and you can just like start reeling them off like that um so yes did do we have any other good ones Priyash, that people threw in especially about gold i'd be impressed no i think gold is mostly historical and probably too yeah. to be given <laughs> yeah. i've not seen anyone treated with gold do they, do they used to treat tb with gold i think they might have done but anyway um we I'll, put, I'll go through the slides here so you, if you watch it again, you can um, press and read through them. But these are the important ones um, to think about. Methotrexate comes up a lot in SBAs, especially it when it's given alongside trimethoprim. Teratogenicity um, is really important and you might have counselling for a woman of childbearing age who's taking methotrexate and she wants to get pregnant. Um, Biologic ther therapy, we've talked about immunosuppression, we've talked about reactivation, and you can get an allergic reaction as well, um, but that's less uncommon. Right, quick quick round of what's the rash? What's this one? Erythema nodosum? Absolutely. What's this one? Someone's put a margarine ulcer. There we go. Pyoderma granulosum. I don't think margarine ulcer is actually a bad shout at all. So for those who um, maybe don't know, margarine ulcer is essentially when you've got a non-healing ulcer and it, it persists and persists and persists. And because it's got such long-standing low-grade inflammation, it actually predisposes you to a squamous cell carcinoma. So a margarine ulcer is an SCC in a pre-existing ulcer. This is a pyoderma gangrenosum though, because you see it's got, it's the classically, it's like the violaceous edge. Um, that's usually how they describe it in SBA stems. Um, and that's the giveaway. And what's this one? Erythema multiform. Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Erythema multiform used to be thought to be a in a spectrum and continuum with um, Stephen Johnson's and um, 10, but now it's felt to be separate. 
So erythema nodosum, why it's important to have this at the back of your mind is because erythema nodosum, they say like painful purple um, lumps on the anterior shins. And that's basically your giveaway for the um, for the underlying diagnosis. It commonly comes up with sarcoid. Um, you'll see that quite commonly as an SBA stem, but also the oral contraceptive. I've seen that before. You can get it with IBD, but you can also get it with TB and you can also get it with things like a strep pneumonia. It's, it's rarer, but it's also worth bearing that in the back of your mind. Erythema multiform is again um, a rash that commonly comes up. The way the way that I've seen it come up in SBAs is it's usually talking about mycoplasma pneumonia. You'll have a young person who's got what they call a walking pneumonia. So they have like a dry cough. They're, they're all right. They're walking about, but they desaturate and they have this rash. And it's usually talking about um, mycoplasma. Right. And then pyoderma gangrenosum is really significantly associated with IBD. So the similar with IBD as with rheumatology, you think, okay, they've got their IBD symptoms, but what are the extra articular manifestations as well? And it's important on that side to ask as, as well. Right. Next question. I think we're coming to the end now, guys. And I promise I'll speed up. I'm almost there. So 70% of people have gone for B. Excellent. So this is your barn door GCA. You've got jaw claudication. You've got double vision. Um, and you've got a tender, probably palpable um, temporal artery. You've got a pallid optic nerve head, which is arteritic. Oh, gosh, I can't even remember. It's A-A-I-O-N. And I thought maybe a few people would fall for the trick here which is referred to local rheumatology clinic for IV methylpred because this patient actually needs IV methylpred because of the visual involvement. But it's not safe to refer someone to a local rheumatology clinic for the IV methylpred. They probably would have prednisolone stat in the GP surgery and they would have a same day urgent opthal review and will probably be put on IV methylpred. So I thought a lot about this question. I think it's a little bit mean, but essentially you don't delay steroids, you don't delay steroids for um, imaging um, or a biopsy and you give the steroids as quickly as possible. But in the case of visual involvement, this patient does need to be on IV methylpred. Um, giant cell arteritis. So it is one of our large vessel vasculit vasculitides, unlike the small, ve small vessel vasculit vasculitides of GPA and EGPA. You, it's commonly associated with PMR, which actually isn't really a vasculitis in itself. It's just an inflammatory, auto-inflammatory condition that causes um, that causes muscle pain. And you classically don't get a raised CK that you'd get in polymyositis. You get your headache, you get your scalp or temple tenderness. So people say, I can't brush my hair or it hurts when I eat. And then what's really important is when you get the sudden painless loss or diplopia, the ocular involvement means that this is a site threatening emergency. And that's why you need to have an urgent ophthal referral, um, urgent ophthal review, review and steroids. Basically, the way that we know that it's GCA or PMR is if you give them steroids, all of their symptoms go away. PMR, you can give much lower doses um, rather than GCA. But because these patients are on steroids for years, you have to think about the secondary prevention as well. So you have to think they need to be on vitamin D, they need to be on calcitude probably, and they need to be on bisphosphonates because they're really high risk of osteoporosis. And they'll need PPI cover as well because they're having steroids all the time that are really high risk of um, like an upper GI bleed. And I've put there IV methylpred in visual symptoms. And also if you've got jaw claudication as well, that's sometimes an indication for IV steroids as well. PMR, very briefly, is you get this sort of sudden onset pain and stiffness in like the shoulder girdle um, and in the pelvic girdle as well. Can be sometimes quite difficult to differentiate from polymyositis. And that's when the CK is important. You get a negative CK and PMR, but you get a high ESR and CRP. In terms of investigations for GCA, 
you commonly actually now, what we do is an ultrasound of the temporal artery rather than a biopsy because the biopsy has loads of skip lesions and it doesn't actually have a very high yield. And increasingly more and more and more and more we're doing PET scans because I won't go into this too much, but um, you don't just get now cranial GCA. So like the temporal arteries involved more and more we're seeing that you get actually an extra cranial vasculitis. So you get like the aorta or larger vessels can be involved as well. Oh, excellent. Good. I whizzed through that last bit. So these are some free resources from Quesmed. Um, and we've got lots of these tutorials on YouTube as well. Um, we hope you've really enjoyed it. Sorry that I went off on a massive tangent at part of it, but we'd be really grateful for some feedback as well. Um, and do we have any questions at all? I know I whizzed through the last bits as well. So if you want me to clarify anything, I'm happy to hold on for a few minutes.